I ask you to take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And I'm always, as I read the chapter one that we're going to look at part of uh, this morning, I'm always amazed at the fortitude and the confidence with which Daniel faces a challenge that I can't even imagine. And he is not all that old here as we, we are introduced to him in chapter 1. He's mid to late teens, likely. He is a very young man. And he's placed into a very difficult circumstance that, from my perspective, from a human perspective, if there is someone that could be forgiven for, for maybe not doing what he ought to have done, from a human perspective, I almost think that maybe someone like Daniel could have fallen into that category. It would have been easy for him to make excuses and to say, well, I, I don't know uh, if I can do this. Um, I don't know if I can actually do what I know is right in this circumstance. And yet we see from this chapter that with confidence, Daniel does that which is right and honors the Lord. And I want to take a look at how Daniel dealt with difficulty. Can we deal with difficulty like Daniel? Daniel chapter 1. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. We'll look beginning in verse 1 and look down through the end of verse 16. <clears throat> so in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king." Then said Daniel unto Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer 
and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine which they should drink and gave them pulse. Let's ask God's blessing as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, for your blessing as we meet around your word to look into it and examine it. Lord, I pray that you'd give me the words to say. Use me as a vessel in your hand. And Lord, I pray that in spite of the limitations that I have, you would be seen in our service together this morning. Lord, challenge our hearts. Help us to be receptive for the truth of your word as it is before us. Lord, be honored and glorified in this time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated, please. Well, as we continue here in the book of Daniel, we see in the first part of the chapter that Jerusalem fell before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar at this time was arguably the most powerful human being in the world. The nation of Babylon conquered nation after nation after nation. Nebuchadnezzar was in control of that nation in, in his eyes. And he viewed, we see later in Daniel, he viewed himself as the most powerful man in the world until God taught him some lessons. But at this point, we're introduced to Nebuchadnezzar, we're introduced to Daniel, the most powerful nation of the world had conquered Jerusalem and many captives were taken back to Babylon. If you look in 2 Kings chapter 20, you'll see that God, through uh, His Word, had predicted that this would happen. If you look in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, through the inspiration of God, in chapter 39 and verse 7, had predicted that this would occur. They had been warned, and yet the people didn't follow God as they should. And often, as we see in Israel's history, they, they didn't follow God. God brought in judgment that caused them eventually to turn to Him, and He would restore them. And this was part of this process. So they had not been walking with God. Babylon came in and, and conquered Jerusalem, and many people were taken captive back to Babylon. And it's interesting to me as I look at chapter 1 as a whole, one of the things that comes to mind is, if there were so many people that had been conquered and taken captive from Jerusalem, brought back to Babylon to live in captivity, why don't we hear more about them? We really only hear much about Daniel and his three friends. There were hundreds that would have been taken. Why not the rest? Why not any others? It's my personal belief, I can't show you from Scripture. It's my personal belief is because many of them didn't make this decision that Daniel did. When you don't stand for what's right, when you don't do what's right, what God wants you to do, you're not going to have his blessing or his power. And that's what sets Daniel here apart and his friends apart from all those others that were taken in captivity. He says here in verse 3, The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed, the princess, children in whom was no blemish, and he has a whole list of qualifications. They were brought back to Babylon, as we've said. But in verse 5, we see that there's an issue. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, and at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And then it says in verse 6, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Here we have a problem. Daniel was born 
in the land of Israel. He was in the area of Jerusalem. God had very specific laws about what they were to eat and what they were to drink. His whole life, Daniel would have been trained in his eating and drinking habits before the Lord to honor God in what he chose to eat and what he chose not to eat or to drink or not to drink. And now from a human perspective, that choice is being taken away. So what do you do in a situation like that? When, when you know what is right, but there are those who expect you not to do what is right, but to do something else. Here's where Daniel's convictions came into play. Daniel was taught what was right. But you know, no one really can make you do what is right. For many years, I was a Christian school teacher, much of it in the high school, and I loved teaching in the high school. I tried before the Lord. The Bible class was one of the classes. It was always my favorite class to teach. And I tried to teach them what was right. but I couldn't make him do it. You know, there was a, many times when before the Lord, I would see the choices that some of my students made after they graduated or when they were outside of school. And, and I would look at, at the choices they made and think, Lord, what did I do wrong? What, where did I go wrong that here they didn't get enough truth maybe? I, I somehow didn't do a, a job that was sufficient. It was a long time before I came to the understanding my responsibility before the Lord was to present them with the truth. But for them, it was to choose whether or not they would do it. Daniel here had a choice to make. His friends had a choice to make. He had the truth. He knew what God wanted. Now, what was he going to do about it? And we see as we look through the rest of the book of Daniel, he had convictions. When he knew the truth, he did what he knew to be right. We find in Daniel chapter 6, when the law was made that for 30 days no one was to pray to any other god but the king. We don't see that Daniel wrestled with what he should do about that. The Bible doesn't give us any indication that Daniel had any kind of internal struggle as to what his course of action was going to be. It says that he went to his house and he opened the windows three times a day and he prayed toward Jerusalem three times a day. And it says, as he did aforetime. And may I challenge you this morning, particularly you young people, when you're in the middle of the problem, it's pretty late to be trying to form your convictions. Form your convictions early, based upon God's Word. I always said to my students, I have no issue with you asking me, why can't I do this, or why shouldn't I do this, or why can't I do that, as long as you really want to know the answer. A lot of times, why can't I, why can't I, why shouldn't I, is not a sincere question, it's a debate. You know, sometimes we do the same thing with God. We're faced with difficult circumstances, we would like to do this, but we know God wants us to do that. Well, Lord, what, what about this? Form your convictions early and base them on God's Word. So that when the challenge comes, you'll know what the right thing to do is. And that's half the battle. But there was more that Daniel had to do. And we find that as they're presented with this situation, 
It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. It's one thing to know in your head the truth. I've seen young person after young person after young person grow up in Christian homes and in a good church. They weren't, they weren't unaware of the truth. They had the theoretical knowledge of the truth. But a knowledge of a head and a purpose in a heart are two very different things. And we see here that Daniel purposed in his heart. The idea of purpose there means to direct toward. Daniel said, no, this is the direction God wants me to go. And that is the direction I must go. You know, it's one thing to think, well, I ought to. It's something different to think, no, I must. This is not an option. This is not a, well, I kind of should. This is I must. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor the wine which he drank. When he was faced with the difficulty, he purposed to do what was right. But again, there's more to be done. In the last half of that verse, he didn't just purpose in his mind or in his heart to do that which is right. He followed through with it. He says, therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. When he understood what it was that he must do, he did it. There have been many times in my life I've known what I must do. I have purposed to do what I know I must do. And then I haven't done it. Or I started out doing it for a while. But somehow, as time passed by, I stopped. Even though I knew it was right, even though at one time I had purpose to do it, I stopped doing it. Over the course of the years, I've seen many young people at youth conferences purpose to do something that God challenged their heart about. And they had every intention of doing it at that time. But somewhere along the way, between the purposing and the practicing, something derailed. And we see here Daniel, when he purposed in his heart, he immediately takes action to put it into practice. He goes and he makes this request to the prince of the eunuchs. And he, we see here, the mindset of the prince of the eunuchs. But it's interesting, in, in chapter 1, verse 8, where it says that Daniel purposed in his heart, that's probably the most well-known part, except maybe Daniel in the lion's den, in this whole book. But in my Bible, in, in chapter 1, there are two words that I have underlined and highlighted. To me, they are of great significance to me personally, because we see in verse 9 that after Daniel purposed in his heart and he took action, he, he went to the prince of eunuchs and said, I, I don't want to defile myself. This is what I would like you to do. It says here in verse 9, now God, what are the next two words? had brought. Present tense, future tense, past tense. Oh, uh, didn't know there was a class. This is past tense. When you purpose in your heart to do what is right 
and you move forward to do what you know is right. God does the rest. I see here in verse 9, those two little words tell me that when Daniel purposed in his heart to do what was right, God was already at work. God had already put in place the relationship that would be required for Daniel's request to be honored. And many times, when we purpose to do what is right and we put feet to that purpose, we see God's already been busy. He's already been doing things behind the scenes we had no knowledge of and providing for us in ways we could never have planned. I remember when we first moved in 2004, we moved to Ontario to begin teaching in the school there. We had a car that was only a couple of years old. I figured to you know do the Ontario inspection, no problem. Um, I took it in to be inspected. Uh, there were $600 worth of repairs required that I had not anticipated, and I was a Christian school teacher, so it wasn't like, you know, there was a lot extra. And I thought, what am I going to do? Lord, I, I had not anticipated this. In our budgeting and planning, this, this was not there. And I came home, and I told my wife, we have... Uh, a bill I did not anticipate. And I remember she smiled and she handed me a letter from my aunt in South Carolina. And in that was a check. When I cashed that check, it was 603 Canadian dollars. She had mailed it more than a week before, yet it arrived on the day. We knew that God wanted us to be there. We didn't know how he was going to work things out. That was not a coincidence. When we purposed to do what God wanted us to do, he was already at work. And a week before I ever knew that I even had this bill, it was already on the way. And it says here, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king. From a human perspective, do you blame him? The most powerful man in the world has said, These are your instructions. One of the captives comes to you and says, this is what I would like you to do. If I'm the prince of the eunuchs, that's an easy call for me. I'm going to do what Nebuchadnezzar said. Because if I don't and I get caught, I'm going to die. It shows to me the extent to which God had been at work. What kind of a relationship, what kind of favor must God have provided to Daniel in the Prince of the Eunuch's eyes that he would be willing to do this? I'm in his position. I'm not doing it no matter how much I might think of Daniel. But God had been at work. And God had done something that only he could do. And although he was afraid of, as he says, my Lord the King, he also agreed to do it. Because God was at work, He agreed to do it. And so he says there, in spite of his questions, Now I fear my Lord the King, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should I see your faces, or he see your faces worst liking, 
the children which are of your sort. Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. He says, listen, if I do this, and you guys don't look so good when you go before the king, and he wants to know why, I'm in trouble. And Daniel says, prove thy servants. The word prove there means to put to the test. I had some, I guess, a couple of acquaintances when I was in junior high. They were from the States, um, and their father worked at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. They test different kinds of military equipment, and that's what they call it, the proving ground, because they're putting things to the test to see what uses do they have, where do they not, what are the side effects, you know, what should we avoid, what are the concerns. And that's the sense in which this word is used. Daniel said, listen, if you're, if you're afraid, just allow us to run a little test for a few days. Now, if during those few days, Nebuchadnezzar had found out what was going on, would the prince of the eunuchs still have been in trouble? Absolutely. Yeah. And even though this is just a little test for a few days, the risk to him is still great. And yet, he agrees. In verse 14, it says, So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. God's hand continues to work in the lives of those who choose and purpose to do what is right. So when Daniel purposed in his heart, he saw God at work. But there's something interesting to me as well in, the, in this chapter. When it begins in verse 8, it says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat or the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs. It's singular. This is a, a purposing that Daniel made in his own heart to please God. But if you look down further in the chapter, Daniel says in verse 12, Prove thy servants, plural, ten days. And as you read the rest of this chapter and the rest of what was done, it was no longer singular. It was not just about Daniel. It was about all of them. May I make this observation this morning? When you purpose to do what is right, and you put feet to that, it will affect other people. There may be some who don't care for it. There may be some who don't like it. But there also may be some who follow. I used to challenge the high school boys when I started in Ontario. Are you the kind of person you would want to follow? I remember being in the office with Pastor Pennell one time. I, I wasn't in trouble. Um, but I remember talking to him, and my wife was playing the piano, or the organ, I forget which, for the services. And so she left Ben with me until such time as she could get some things done to come back and pick him up and take him into the church service. And so Pastor Pennell was just kind of chatting with him and asking him, what do you want to be with, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? His answer scared me to death. Because Pastor Pennell, you want to be a missionary or a teacher? He said, I want to be like Dad. Now, I don't know if he'll still give you that answer. <laughs> It scared me to death. I thought, Lord, what if he is? What would that mean? 
I'm setting an example that someone's going to follow. What if they do? Is that okay? We used to do, I, I guess it was kind of a, it's an illustration, I guess you could call it a skit, but there would be a group of people standing on the platform, each with a candle. And they'd be singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And then there would be a person who came in kind of in character portraying the devil and his actions, and they would come close to one of the people and blow their candle out. And when they, their candle was blown out, they stopped singing. So we might start with a dozen people, and one candle goes out, the volume drops a little. But then another, and another, and another, and the volume is reduced. Until there's just one left singing all alone. And their candle is burning. And as the character of the devil comes to blow that candle out, they put their hand up and shield it and sing, Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. And eventually, the character that's displaying or portraying what Satan would do leaves. And one by one, the candle is reached over and reignited. And another. And another. And the voices begin once again to grow in number and in volume. I believe that's what Daniel did here. And we'll hear more from his friends in the chapter taking another stand. When they purposed to do what was right and they refused to bow. Daniel's actions, I believe, affected those who were around him. What about you? What about me? If I understand that my actions affect the people around me, and if you understand that your actions, for God in particular, affect those who are around you, what effect are we having? What difference are we making? We've been blessed with a number of young people here in the church. Do we encourage them in the right direction? Do we set a good example that if they followed it, that would please God? Daniel here was in a very difficult circumstance. In his mid to late teens, he was dragged halfway across the world, a foreign language, a foreign culture. He was told, you're going to do things that dishonor your God. He knew it was wrong. But boy, that's an awful lot of pressure to put on a young person to stand for truth. And the thing that I admire most about Daniel is he did it. When I may have said, okay, if that's what I have to eat, that's, I guess, what I have to eat. He said, no, God's not pleased by that. I'm going to do what's right. But in purposing to do what's right, he got to see what God could do. In a way, he did not have any way of planning himself. But he also got to see the effect that that purpose had on those around him, and he saw three others follow his lead and stand for truth because he purposed in his heart. My question for you this morning is, have you purposed in your heart to do, not just to know, but to do that which is right? If you do, and you put feet to it, you'll see God work, and you'll see that you have an opportunity to affect those who are around you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. Lord, I pray that you would challenge our hearts, that as Daniel was placed in a difficult situation, purpose to do that which is right. Lord, we are grateful as we gather together this morning to know that you're a God that's in control. We don't always see it. We don't always understand it. Lord, we know that you are. Lord, we thank you for that. 
and for the confidence that we can have in doing what is right. Lord, help us to purpose in our hearts to do what is right, to see you at work. And Lord, help us to understand that there are those who are watching who need to see us do what is right in a way that pleases you. Lord, I pray that you would challenge our hearts, help us to examine ourselves, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.